Welcome to a very special evening program on WKMC TV with a very special guest who is a new teacher this year here at Mount Carmel area. Mrs. Rizzo is the English as a Second Language or ESL teacher whose experiences with other cultures is beyond measure. She has visited far over 30 countries starting with Australia where she was born. A few countries later Rizzo met her husband in China. However, in between these two life landmarks was the biggest stepping stone of them all. Through a program called World Youth International, which she discovered in a local newspaper, Joanne Rizzo took a trip to Kenya for six months as a teacher. But ultimately, she did most of the learning herself. Mrs. Rizzo, anyone who's seen you around the school or heard you knows that you don't sound like the typical coal cracker. Where are you from? I'm from Australia. I grew up in southeastern Australia in the state of Victoria. The area, if this is the coal region, I grew up in an area called Gippsland, farming area, um, close to the coast, but we didn't go to the beach too much. What was school like? Where did you go to school? I went to primary school, which is the same as elementary, at Pakenham Consolidated School. It was the same school my mum went to. They had oh. really old buildings and some newer buildings. Then I went to high school at Pakenham, Pakenham Secondary College. Mixed school, about the same size as Mount Carmel, so pretty What's similar. What's the difference between life in America and life in Australia? Not too much. Australians are, I would say, much more outdoorsy. A lot of outdoor sports. School is a little different. We still have lunch outside, even when we're in high school. You get an hour for lunch. You can eat outside. We don't have cafeterias in most schools, so you bring your own lunch. You get an hour to socialize, which <laughs> is great. Day-to-day um, -day life is, is pretty much the same. Yep. Same television shows, although we have our Australian ones <laughs> too. <laughs> yep. So after Australia, obviously you're not there anymore. What was next? After Australia, I did a few short trips overseas when I was still at high school. I went to Bali, Fiji. Then when I was in, uh, finished high school, I went to, actually came here to America and worked at a summer camp in Wisconsin and then lived in Canada for about four months. Returned to Australia, went to university, had a short trip to Thailand. And then I was teaching full time couldn't continue teaching because we had a drop in enrollment figures at our school. It was a very small school with seven teachers. So two of us had to either volunteer to leave or we wouldn't have had a class the following year. Okay. So I saw an ad in the newspaper to teach in Africa. That was it. I, was, I knew exactly what I was going to do. So I uh, applied to the ad in the paper. It was for an organization called World Youth International had an interview in Melbourne, was accepted, and two months later, I was flying to Kenya. How did you prepare for that? What did you do? I sold my car to pay for my airplane ticket. Actually, I went into the principal's office when I was still teaching, and I told him what I was planning to do. And I was on the phone to the travel agent booking my ticket to Kenya. He popped his head in and he overheard me say, well, I might as well just keep going to England if that's the same price. The travel agent then booked my one-way trip from Australia to Africa to the UK. I got a two-year work visa for England and had no money. So <laughs> I prepared by selling my car <laughs> and buying a plane ticket and that was that. What about your family? How did they react to it all? Um, my parents were just great. They brought me up to be independent, which is good. Um, we'd always traveled when I was younger, so I had the background of always going somewhere. Normally it was just small family trips, but they were the first ones to take me overseas and I got the travel bug, so there was no looking back. Okay, so now we're, we're in Africa. Yes. What was that like? Africa was amazing. It's like another planet, and that's not in a bad way. It's just so totally removed from everything I was used to. I arrived in Nairobi, and my immediate reaction to the city was I hated it. It was dirty. It was loud. 
the first hour we were there, another girl I was with had her watch snatched off her arm. It was not a pleasant place to stay. Thankfully, we knew we weren't going to stay there, so we had our eyes open, watched everything, and then left as soon as we could. <laughs> um, we took a bus to the western part of Kenya, the province of Gem, um, and we were headed for the village of Matumbu, which is where I was going to live for six months. So <laughs> it was quite a change. Uh, we crossed the Rift Valley, which was beautiful. Um, the scenery, green, lush gardens, vegetable gardens maintained by locals, sugarcane, maize. They grow, they call it corn, but it's, right. it's field corn. They don't have sweet corn, unfortunately. Um, lots of farming, lots of jungle type <laughs> areas. Yeah. What about the nice. living conditions? Living conditions were really interesting. We lived in a regular sized village. The, the um, village center was called the Mutumbu Market, had concrete buildings, mud buildings, mud huts with mm -hmm. thatched roofs, um, some tin roofs on some of the buildings, but only one shop in the whole village had electricity and they had a fridge. I think I bought a soda there maybe twice because they were really expensive and more often than not, the electricity wasn't on, so it was cold anyway. Oh, it wasn't cold anyway, so. <laughs> um, we lived in a compound on the edge of town, which was basically a C-shaped concrete structure mm -hmm. with a gated entrance. They would lock the gate at night. Um, Right behind us were mud huts with thatched roofs, which is what I really wanted to live in, <laughs> but they were trying to treat us <laughs> with <laughs> importance, so we got the concrete building. My room was a little bit larger than this space here. This was my whole house. I had one room. I had a bed, a dresser, a desk, and a chair. That was my house. Bathroom? No bathrooms. <laughs> Can you go without a bathroom for six months? Ooh, I'm not sure. Not <laughs> sure. We had pit toilets out the back, bathroom in the pit toilet. You would shower if you wanted in the pit toilet. Basically, you would have to transport your water and take a bird bath or <laughs> dump it over you. It was much easier in the pit toilet because you could just dump the water and it would drain away. It didn't smell too good though, <laughs> so I tended to bathe in my actual house just with a washcloth. Yes. So washed my hair maybe once a week if I was lucky, because you just you didn't have enough water to have the luxury of washing right. your hair every day or every two days. You weren't the only person there, right? The teaching thing. No, there were three of us, all from Australia. One, she was actually American, but had been living in Australia for quite a few years. So, three Australians, all girls. All teachers from Australia. We each had our own little house and we were each assigned different schools. So during the day we didn't really see each other, but in the evenings we gathered together and had our evening meal with the family who lived right next door to me. I guess you could call them our host family. Mom, a dad, and they had two young boys, a four-year-old and a one-year-old, and their adopted niece who was 11. Um, her parents had died, so the custom is that another family member will adopt the surviving children. She had brothers and sisters who we never met because they were all living with other families. So they had three kids and they were there the whole time, which was great. Did you like come close? Our yeah. Very close. How was the teaching? Teaching was great. I was teaching in a primary school which had grades K through 8. Lots of little kids, fewer older kids as the, the classes go on. And then the high school was next door, which was mm -hmm. basically like a, a high school here with 9 through 12. Um, officially, I was supposed to be teaching English to 6th grade, mm -hmm. mathematics to 5th grade, and then start off with an art and craft class, mm -hmm. class for grade 4, which was quite interesting because the grade four students didn't speak English. 
and I was just learning their language once I arrived in the country. So they spoke Luo, which is the local language, and Swahili, which is the national language right. of Africa. So these little students knew two languages and were just learning English but couldn't say anything more than hello. My older students, fifth and sixth, mm -hmm. had both been learning English for two years, so or three years. So they were fine. I could converse with them freely. And they're so excited to teach me their language that I picked up hmm. a lot of that while I was there. After about two weeks, the younger kids loved my art and craft class so much that they added in grade three. Now, grade three and grade four, like I said, had more students. So it was typical that I had 70 students in one class. Wow. Grade three, 70 students. The classrooms were about the same size as a classroom here, maybe a little smaller. Our school was a stone construction, window spaces, but no windows. Mm -hmm. Their desks were very crude, wooden planks. The desks probably seated about 25 kids. So when you have 70 students in a class, the average desk would seat mm -hmm. maybe three or four students. They would have six to eight students squashed onto a desk. They would sit in each other's laps. They would sit on the floor. They would sit on the edge of the desk. They would sit on the window ledge just to all fit into the room. Art and craft was fun. I, needless to say, took them outside a lot because we had more <laughs> space. Okay. Um, I would ask them to bring in local resources. I, they would bring in sticks. They were called, I think they were called sisal sticks. We would do a lot of construction on the dirt using sticks. They would make models of huts. They would make models of animals. We would draw in the dirt. I didn't have a lot of teaching supplies. Okay. Pencils, paper, they weren't there. But I had one little teaching manual per class about an inch thick, and that was for the whole year. Did everyone have a pencil? Not everyone. Um, one little boy in particular had a pencil that was about an inch long. It was his prized possession. It was passed down to him from his older brothers who had finished school. He didn't sharpen it very much, otherwise he wouldn't have <laughs> had a pencil for the rest of the year. So. What a difference. It, it was a, a huge difference. I did bring a box of art supplies with me, mm -hmm. but I ended up giving that out mostly as rewards to students who were working well. We made some little little projects using colored paper, which I know they the students took them home and put them on the walls and they probably stayed there for years. But yeah, supplies were limited. We used what we had. So what did you teach in English class? English class, I had a book that I had to follow, but it was too structured. <laughs> you know, grammar, mechanics of sentences. I really wanted to get them using their conversational right. English. So we would have a lot of discussions. We would go outside too and, and talk about what we saw. At the end of class, we would spend time singing and playing the drum. This is my African drum. My, uh, my sixth grade boys were wonderful at drumming on anything. They didn't have a drum like this. They used a plastic margarine tub and a stick, or they would just use the desk and a stick, and they would have the best oh. rhythms, and then the girls would start singing. So <laughs> the last five, 10 minutes of class kind of tended to end in a song, which How was How long nice. were classes? Classes were about the same as here, about mm -hmm. 40 minutes. Um, the students would, would go from classroom to classroom, depending on which teacher they had. They had a lo longer lunch than you do here mm -hmm. because there's no lunch at school, and some of the students would live an hour away from the school. Oh. So having a longer lunch enabled them to run home, grab something to eat, and run back to school. Run? Run, because they didn't have time to walk. If they lived far enough away, they would run home, grab a corn cob, and run back. 
Some would bring lunch to school and just sit outside. More often than not, though, they would travel home and get something for lunch. You said the class sizes got smaller as they went mm -hmm. up. Why mm -hmm. was that? Um, parents had to pay for their students to go to school and it cost money that they didn't have. Right. So either students would leave school at a younger age or they might come for a week and then not be at school for a week if their parents couldn't afford to pay the fee mm -hmm. um, on a continual basis. There were so many kids in a family that the parents couldn't afford to send mm -hmm. all of them to school. So unfortunately, not all of the kids in a family would end up getting an education. But I think a lot of times the students would go home and teach right. their younger brothers and sisters everything they could. They would also come and find me after school <sighs> on the weekends and bring their little brothers and sisters along to meet me and talk and they would practice their English. They would ask questions about what life was like outside of Africa. I mean, these families don't travel anywhere. They, they don't get outside of their area at all. So what about the other teachers? Do you think that the students liked them and had the bond they had with you? I'm sure they did. Um, one of the girls I was with worked at the high school in the village where we lived. She ended up setting up a scholarship for her students so one student at the end of each year would get, I think it was $100 she would donate to help that student either start off their own business or continue their education. Most students tried to do something back in their village to mm -hmm. help support their family. Some went off to college. Teaching was a popular career. Nursing was a popular career. Other than that, I don't really remember any students talking about other fields that they were going to pursue. It, just making a living was, was hard enough. Teaching yep. style was different. What about the learning styles? Are they anything special? <sighs> they were so eager to learn anything from me. I, I had students who I'd seen for a week at school and then they would come to my house after school and just stand at my door. I didn't even know their name yet and I would be faced with students just standing there watching me. They'd watch me do my washing, they'd watch me <laughs> write in my diary. They just wanted to be near me, which is quite humbling when you're not used to being the center of attention. Right. You, you really were because one, you, you look so different you're a foreigner, you, you know all these other things, you can speak another language. They were pretty excited and I think they soaked everything up. Did any yeah. of the other teachers not like the experience? Everyone enjoyed it? I think one of the teachers I was with, she was a little homesick. I think it took a little longer for her to settle in. The advantage I had was that I'd been out of Australia before, mm -hmm. so I had traveled, I'd, I'd been to Southern Asia and there's a similarity between the level of poverty in Asia and Africa. I, I didn't have a problem with it, I think. One of the other teachers in particular had a huge problem with the punishment that students mm. at school would get caned if they did something wrong. They would even bring their own canes into school and this, it, it upset all of us, but I was able to deal with it my own way. For example, math class, my girls would bring in canes and drop them at the foot of the chalkboard. After a couple of weeks, I would pick them up and throw them out the window. And the students would just look at me in shock, like I'd done something really bad another teacher, I mean, and I would hear them get caned during the day, mm -hmm. you know, if they did something wrong in class or were late back from lunch, they would be beaten. And it's really sad. There were reports in the paper while we were there that there was too much caning and that it needed to stop, but we couldn't really do anything. Right, they're the guests. <laughs> I, I had my own little rebellion by throwing the canes out the window because there was no caning in my classroom. and. I spoke up a couple of times when other teachers caned my students and 
they seemed to settle down a little and, and not do so much while I was there, I think, which was nice and better for the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about after school? It was like life like then. After school was was fun. I after a month after school I also went to the local polytechnic, which is like a tech school. They yeah. taught home economics. They had a tailor workshop, a dressmaking room, and then masonry, and boys would learn how to build constructures mm -hmm. using rocks, bricks, stones, whatever they had. Um, the teachers there found out that I could cook, and I knew how to sew, and I could knit. So they employed me as their home economics teacher, which is quite funny, because they only had one student who was taking home economics. They had three <laughs> students doing dressmaking and one who wanted to do home economics. So after school, my regular school, I would travel to the polytechnic, I would walk and teach my student Beatrice how to cook eggs mm -hmm. five different ways. I had to come up with five ways. What so were we did boiled eggs, poached eggs, omelets, scrambled eggs, and I taught her, her how to use them in cakes, <laughs> which they didn't have cakes, so that was something quite different. Then I wanted to teach her how to knit. She had left school at a younger age because she was pregnant. She had a baby, and now she was trying to get some form of education mm -hmm. so she could work for herself and make a living. I wanted to teach her how to knit. I didn't have any knitting needles. I didn't have any wool and I didn't have a pattern. So I sent a letter to my mum, waited a few weeks to get a response. She sent back a pattern, a copy, photocopy of a pattern for baby's booties. I thought that would be perfect because it's small and my student had a baby. I found one ball of wool at the local shop in the market. It was yellow, so that was just fine. Gender neutral. <laughs> Gender neutral but I didn't have any knitting needles. I was coming back from the market and I saw the local bicycle repairman. He was called a Ferengi. And he had all of his bicycle spokes that he would use to repair bicycles with laying out on the ground in front of him. He didn't speak English, but I asked him if I could have four bicycle spokes. I got the message that I could take them, but I had to bring them back when I was done. Mm -hmm. So I borrowed four bicycle spokes from the bicycle repair man, took them home, and both Beatrice and I made a pair of booties. Mine was sent back to Australia. I'd just become an aunt while I was in Africa, so my little nephew got a pair of yellow <laughs> booties, and Beatrice's baby got a pair of yellow oh. booties too. And then we returned the bicycle spokes to the man so he could <laughs> fix his bikes. So that was, that was really interesting. That was a lot of fun. Um, people thought we were crazy, but <laughs> that's what you do when you, you don't have what you need. Right. Yeah. Speaking of dressmaking, what was the yes. wardrobe like? Wardrobe. I have one with me. It's in my bag. Um, the students wore uniforms. Those uniforms were passed down from sibling to sibling, so the girls wore their older sister's dresses. If they came from another school, they would keep the dress from the school where they were at. It might have been a different color. It didn't matter so long as they, mm -hmm. they wore their uniform. They were extremely proud to wear a uniform to school. They might have their buttons done up on their dress, but the back of their dress has a gaping hole where it's been ripped. Mm -hmm. The boys would wear white shirts with every button done up, but he might have no shoes. Most didn't wear shoes because they're more expensive and they wear out much quicker. Mm -hmm. um, so most students have bare feet. I wore long skirts or shirts just because shorts weren't that popular mm -hmm. for women. Boys, it was okay. But I also took to the local custom of wearing a kanga, which is a, a square cloth, which you wrap around, like a wrap around skirt. Oh, yeah. I would wear them all the time, they're so easy. <laughs> and in the heat, they were really good. You would actually drape them over your head like a shawl and they would. This is a kanga, which is the cloth um, most women wear. 
-hmm. This is actually a double one. I would normally cut it in half and wear one as a skirt and one over the top. They're always bright and colourful and most of them have a saying down the bottom. You know, long life, good health or whatever, just, just local sayings. Mm -hmm. um, which, I don't know, I guess it makes them more interesting. So this would be worn by women. Sometimes men would wear the skirts, but I think they would generally have shorts on underneath, which is good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I got used to wearing these quite a lot. Yeah. So how much did they cost? They're not very expensive, maybe $5. And where would you get one? You would get one at the market. The market sold fruits and vegetables, um, dry goods, beans, uh, maize, anything you needed for cooking. There was also a section of the market where they would bring in bales of clothing. The bale would be maybe three or four feet square, filled with clothing, and I assume it all comes from clothing bins like those we use here. When you throw out your clothing, mm -hmm. I know where it ends up because all of the clothing that was then unpacked was for sale and none of it was new. Mm -hmm. But when you, you're living on limited means anyway, you don't have a lot of money to spend on clothes. Most people would have one or two nice outfits that they might wear to church on Sunday or to a special occasion. As I said before, students might have one uniform they would wear for the whole year the same dress for the girls all year long. And then they might have t-shirts and skirts, which were secondhand and passed on. Yeah. You brought up food at the market. Mm -hmm. What about the food customs? Food was, took a lot of getting used to. <laughs> um, the main food, <laughs> the staple diet, consisted of a bread type substance called ugali. Ugali is ground maize meal mm -hmm. cooked with water. So it kind of gets thick like cream of wheat, mm -hmm. even thicker like oatmeal, and then so thick that you can't stir it. You tip the saucepan upside down and it comes out in a mound. Everybody ate this, breakfast, lunch, dinner, every meal, every day you had ugali. You would break off pieces in your hand. If you were eating it with something else, maybe a stew or a soupy vegetable or beans, you would break a piece off, roll it in your hand, and dip your thumb, press your thumb in it, and then use it to scoop up the other food. You didn't have knives and forks and spoons, so even if you ate soup, you had to use your ugali to spoon it into your mouth. We all got very, very sick and tired of ugali because it has no flavor. It's just completely tasteless and boring. And that was the one thing that after a few months, I really didn't want to eat it anymore. There were two types of ugali. There was the, just the regular yellow maize some people would grow white maize and the ugali was so much nicer. So occasionally we would buy the white maize meal and it was like a special treat to have the white ugali instead of the yellow ugali. Your very first meal there, what were your thoughts when you tasted it? Oh, it was great. Ugali was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it was ugali. Um, it was ugali. We had a dish of sukuma wiki which basically it translates as the end of the week. Okay. So when you've gone through the whole week eating whatever you have, all that's left at the end of the week mm -hmm. are these green leafy greens mm -hmm. that like spinach, they grow very easily so everybody has access to grow them. And they're just stewed maybe with a tomato if you're lucky enough to buy a tomato at the market. Okay. So we had Ugali and Sukuma Wiki. That was it. That was it. Yeah, but it was great. What about it was during the week? During the week, same food. 
Um, sometimes we would make motoki, which is a green banana stew. That was one of my favorite meals there. Uh, I wish I could buy green bananas here because I would make is it. Is that like a plantain kind of thing? No, plantains no. are different, plantains are bigger. We probably had a dozen varieties of bananas that grew Ooh. in the village where I lived. I ate bananas all the time. There were little finger bananas, which were only this long. There were red bananas, there were big green bananas, fat yellow bananas, skinny yellow bananas. There were just... Did they taste better than ours? Yes, because yes. it was the only sweet thing I <laughs> ate. <laughs> um, bananas all the time. But this matoki was made from green bananas, an onion, maybe a tomato. I don't know what made it taste so good. Maybe just it had more flavor. Mm -hmm. So that was common. Another common dish was called nyonyo, which is maize, corn, mm -hmm. and beans. Once again, that one got kind of old as well. Um, it was pretty tasteless. But they were the, the main dishes. We also had um, japatis, which are like flour tortillas, mm -hmm. which we would make from scratch. Japatis and a, a grain called green grams. They're a lot like lentils. Mm. So if you're a vegetarian, great, Africa's a good place to be because you didn't hear me mention meat in there. Mm -hmm. We probably had meat once every two weeks. We would buy some basic cuts, off cuts of goat, lamb, <laughs> not sure what the meat was that I ate when I was there, but there's not a lot of livestock. Mm -hmm. It could have been beef too. They had, they had cows around, but we didn't have meat very often because it's really expensive. So. Did you help with the cooking? I did. I helped with the cooking and I collected recipes while I was there so I could continue to make these dishes when I came home. Um, we would cook for the host family, Fred and Judy. Judy would cook most of the time, but the three foreigners, we would help her out. We would take it in turns helping her cook because she was basically cooking for us as well. Mm -hmm. So we would cook all the time. We introduced them to different foods. Something really funny happened w with dinner one night. Judy was cooking pumpkin leaves for us. And the three of us foreigners said, we can't eat pumpkin leaves, they're poisonous. We said, we can eat the pumpkin, the fruit, but not the leaves. And she was like, oh, no, 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 the fruit is poisonous. You can only eat the leaves. So we had wow. this huge cross-cultural clash <laughs> where she thought the part we were eating was poisonous and we thought the part she was eating was poisonous. In the end, we ate the leaves wrapped around, whatever it was wrapped around, and I made pumpkin soup for her, and they had never used a pumpkin to cook with. News spread around the village, and I ended up going to three other people's houses to teach them how to make pumpkin soup, <laughs> which was great. Now, you don't eat pumpkin soup much no. here, too. You make <laughs> pumpkin pies. Mm -hmm. In Australia, we don't make pumpkin pies. We make pumpkin soup. So Is it sweet? Just no. No? No. It's like a vegetable, oh. soup, but pureed pumpkin. Mm -hmm. So the pumpkin soup was one of the interesting foods. We also had, um, we, did, we cooked on a pot, one pot, over a small fire. The fire was either three stones with coals in, or it was a small coal stove about this high. You would start it off with kindling and then put pieces of coal in. Mm -hmm. So you had one pot at a time. Whatever your meal was, they normally made the ugali first, dumped that out, and then made the other dish. Okay. Not more than two dishes at a time, though, unless it was a special occasion. Who did the harvesting? Everyone in the family. Everyone? If every family had a vegetable plot called a shamba. They would go to their shamba after school was finished, work their garden, harvest their vegetables, bring them home, cook them, eat them. The next day would be the same, go to school or go to work, then go to the shamba, 
work their garden, harvest their vegetables, bring them wow. home. So they, they ate what they grew. If they couldn't grow what they needed, they would trade. Um, some families grew a lot of beans. They would let the bean plants dry off and then they would collect the beans, the, they pull up the whole bush, bring them back to their hut, lay down. Sometimes they would lay down a tarp, sometimes they would do it just straight on the dirt. Then they would get sticks and this was so much fun and you would bash the beans, <laughs> the, the whole plants until all the beans fell out. They would remove the, the stalks and the leaves and then we would sort beans and it would take hours because they were all different colored. So we would have red beans and purple beans and black beans and white beans and yellow beans and blue beans and we would sort them into baskets. And the kids love doing that because it's like playing with buttons or blocks. <laughs> they would just sit there for, for so long. Um, the family would keep some of the beans to cook with. They mm -hmm. would keep some to plant again. And then if they had enough, they would sell them or trade them. So you could make money from your garden. If other people didn't have a big enough garden, mm -hmm. they would buy beans from you. What yeah. were the portions like? Well, you kind of, everybody ate from the you same dish. You could eat as much as you want. So you could eat as much as you want, but whatever was there was for everyone to share. Yeah. A lot of times you would have unexpected guests just pop in and they would eat too. So you didn't necessarily cook more, everybody just got a little less. Okay. Um, there were times when I went to my students' family homes. Mm -hmm. They would ask me to come meet their family. So on the weekends or after school, I would travel with my student and they would always come to collect me. They would come to my house, knock at the door, Miss Jo, come, come. You're going to meet my family. Sometimes I wouldn't even know. They would just knock on my door. Come, come. Okay, where are we going? Just come, come with me. And I would go to their, their family village. I was expecting to sit around and eat with everybody, but no. I'm a special guest, so they would put you in a hut by yourself, all alone. Occasionally, a student would come in and sit and smile and then they'd leave <laughs> because everybody else in, in their, their family was cooking for me. They would kill a chicken for me. They would cook 10 dishes, but they wouldn't eat it. They would bring out one dish at a time for me to eat some of. When I was full, they would take it away. They would bring the next dish. I thought it was horrible because <laughs> I really wanted to spend time with them. <laughs> and not just be stuck in a hut mm -hmm. by myself eating their food, I knew that they would get to eat the food that I didn't eat. So I would eat a little bit and I'm <laughs> full and then they would bring me something else to try and I'd eat a little bit knowing that their family would get to eat okay. the rest, which was good. But you were kind of isolated as a special guest. It was very strange. What did you drink? I had water all the time. Um, water was precious. We would have to go and either collect water if it wasn't raining or thankfully I lived there during the wet season where it would rain mm -hmm. every day at about four o'clock. We would place big water barrels under the roof line and catch water. So I had water and I had my quinine tablets so I wouldn't get malaria, okay. but they taste so bitter and so disgusting that after a couple of weeks, I stopped using the tablets and just drank the water. I didn't let my water sit around too long, um, but it, as it was the only thing I drank, it, it was gone pretty quickly. And then if my neighbor wasn't there to go get water, she used to, she went to school for half a day and then did chores around the house for mm -hmm. the other half of the day. If she hadn't got water, we would go fetch water. And that's what this is, this is all about. This is a banana leaf ring, okay. which is all dried out now. Um, when you go to collect water or when you carry anything in Africa, mm -hmm. they don't carry things in their hands. They carry everything on their head. 
And after I lived there for six months and carried things on my head, it really is so much easier. You have your hands free to do other things with, and you're completely balanced. So I would get my banana ring, place it on my head, get a five gallon bucket of water, sit the water bucket on the ring. This would help it balance. Mm -hmm. um, it made it a little more comfortable. <laughs> we would also use rags or cloths, twist it up into a, a, a Do donut shape. My, my neighbor made this for me. She was 11. Her name was Adongo and she came with me wherever I went. If I went to the market, she would be there. She was like a little shadow. So we would carry water. One day in particular when I did this, I went with their maid. They had a, a maid who they employed to help with the youngest son because both Fred and Judy, my neighbors, were teachers. So they would work all day. And I went with Esther, the maid, to collect water. And it was one of the most strenuous things I've ever done. It was so hard. But I was really proud of myself because I didn't spill a drop. And I was walking on rocky paths <laughs> through the jungle, from the stream, back to our village, all with the help of my little banana ring. So water was precious. And you looked after it, and that was the only thing I drank. People, w we would actually get invited for, to have tea. Um, but their tea was so sweet. It was, and it was hot, and the weather oh. was hot, which is probably good because then you sweat and you cool down, mm -hmm. but their tea was so sweet. Milk and sugar and tea every single time. They had, you couldn't ask for tea black. You couldn't ask for tea without sugar. This was just how tea was served. So it was tea or water. Yeah. So what type of community was it? Was it every family for themselves, or did they collaborate a lot? Mostly every family for themselves. Like I said, if you had something to trade, you could trade. Mm -hmm. We had Fred and Judy's very good friends lived right behind us in a mud hut. And to me, they were like the African family. Fred and Judy were a little more modernized. They had a television, although we didn't have electricity. So every now and again, I don't know how they did it every now and again, they would turn it on, but there wasn't really anything to watch. <laughs> they were both teachers, so they had more money. Fred was the local coordinator for the, the international group that I was there with, so he'd traveled somewhat, at least to Nairobi, the capital. He hadn't been out of the country at that stage. Um, but their neighbors behind them were, to me, just real Africans. They had their mud hut that they would paint the bottom third of with cow manure to repel insects. Okay. They had two rooms in their mud hut. I think they had maybe five or six children. So the parents would sleep in one room with the baby and the other kids, when it was bedtime, would sleep in the main room. But the main room was also their living room, <laughs> their everything room. Most people cooked outside, so they, they didn't have their cooking pot inside. But they would bring their goat over and walk around the village and sell milk, which is really sweet when you've got a nine-year-old boy mm -hmm. leading his goat around. And you sell a cup of milk at a time because he would actually milk the goat into the cup and then sell you the cup of milk. You'd have to tip the milk out into your own container because that was his cup and off he'd go to the next hut. So the community worked together. Mm -hmm. um, very family orientated. If somebody in your family died and there were children, like I said, at the start, the children would live with other family mm -hmm. members, so they really tried to look after their own. Um, unfortunately, there were a lot of funerals while I was there. From the second week that I was there until the second last day that I was there, we had funerals were constantly. There, hospitals? there was a hospital. There was a, what was called the Mutumbu Dispensary, was in our village. 
it was a hospital, um, but I would not have wanted to go in there for anything. I walked past a door one day and I, have a, I took a photo of a boy who had a gash on his leg and the doctor was putting a bandage on his leg, but there was a screen, like a, a dressing screen, or in hospitals you have screens up that you can move so you can't see mm -hmm. from one area. There was a screen behind him that had three panels that were ripped and had like stains splattered on them that it wasn't a place where I wanted to go and I'm glad I didn't really get sick while I was there, so that was a plus. Yeah, I, di I had one injury while I was there. I kicked a rock. I was in a thunderstorm running from my house to my neighbors and they normally had their door propped open with a mm -hmm. rock. Well, because of the amount of rain, they'd closed their door and I ran straight into the rock and my entire toenail came off. Um, so I had to deal with that. That was my, my little injury. Um, but the, the communities were so people orientated. Like Seems that way. People, people, they're just, they were wonderful. <laughs> Is it a stereotype? I've always wondered, all the big piercings and the plates and all that, did you see? Not in the area where I was. That's, um, there are so many different tribes in Africa. I was with the Luos. Traditionally, they don't do anything. <laughs> they, they have short hair normally, girls and boys. The girls would get extensions in oh. all the time, which is really cute. Um, teachers that I worked with, sometimes they'd have hair this long and then three weeks later they would be <laughs> up here again and I wouldn't recognize them. Um, but traditionally, the people I lived with were modernized, not tribal mm -hmm. at all. When I, I had a chance to go traveling through other countries in Africa, I did see some Maasai, Maasai warriors, okay. the Maasai, and that's what this, this blanket is from. This was their traditional dress, unlike the kanga that I showed you before, mm -hmm. which is made of cotton, this is made of wool. Mm -hmm. So it's a little thicker, um, but they have their earlobes cut, so they will, will have their ears pierced basically and then they will wear really heavy earrings to stretch the lobes once they stretch enough then they will cut them so they actually have really long loops that hang down um, and the first Maasai I saw I was on a train I'd fallen asleep I woke up and he was just standing right in front of me staring at me it freaked me out just a little <laughs> bit but I think he was trying to protect me because there were probably pickpocketers and okay. whoever else on the train and he just stood there and smiled at me and after a while he went and sat down but the first thing I noticed was he had his earlobes looped up over <laughs> the top of his ear <laughs> later on I asked someone about that and they said well it gets annoying when their their earlobe is hanging down when they're <laughs> running it kind of bangs against their cheeks, so they just hook it up if they don't have earrings in. Um, but no, no lip plates okay. or neck rings. The Maasai <laughs> women do wear neck rings. Um, but nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy. Yeah. You said about the pickpocketers, about mm -hmm. crime rates. Anything in your village? Our village, I think, was fine. Um, they did lock our gate yeah. at night, and they had a guard who stood out there, but he wasn't there just for us. It, that was just the common practice. If there was a compound, and, which was mostly housed by teachers, mm -hmm. they would have a guard and they would lock the gate. Um, I didn't have a single problem while I was in Africa. Nothing was stolen, no harm done. Unfortunately, one of the girls I was with, she had a watch stolen our first day right. in Nairobi. We went on a bus trip to Uganda. She had her camera stolen. We went on a Matatu, which is a local taxi. It's like a pickup truck with an open canopy. It's open at the back. And you fit as many people as you can inside sitting on bench seats. Mm -hmm. When the bench seats are full, you will cram in there standing up, bent over because the canopy makes it a little hard to stand up. 
And once that's full, you just stand on the outside and hold on. And we had some Matatu rides where what, her backpack was stolen on one of them. So that poor girl, like, <laughs> everything that could go wrong went wrong for her. Um, but I was fine. Um, the Matatus were, were really scary. We tried not to use them hmm. too often because every day, every week, there were accidents and the death rate was pretty high. You can imagine 20 people hanging onto the back of the yes. pickup truck, flying down a road, you know, with most of the road was potholes. You, there wasn't really a flat surface. So off the road, on the road, through the potholes, they, it was pretty dangerous driving. What was the closest city? Closest city was called Kasumu. Um, there was post office, a bank, hotels, um, shopping center. I don't remember doing much shopping there because basically our food was provided mm. for us in the village. When we did go to Kasumu though, we always went to the Hotel Natasha because they had chocolate milkshakes. <laughs> we could buy French fries and you could get a meal there really cheaply, like a small meal. But that was our, you know, Western experience. <laughs> like go back and get some real food, go to the Hotel Mata Natasha for a milkshake and, or an orange Fanta. I, I didn't have Coke there. I don't think they had Coke, but I would have orange Fanta or a mm -hmm. milkshake. Um, so Kasuma was, was pretty big, not like Nairobi. Okay. Um, I mean, it was a city city. Kasumu was on the edge of Lake Victoria, um, which wasn't too far away. So I got to see Lake Victoria and see the pink flamingos, which just cover the lake. It's beautiful. Um, Did you go back to Nairobi at all after that bad first experience? No. no? Only when I had to fly no. out of there. Yeah, that was, I don't want to <laughs> go to Nairobi. Yeah. What about on the opposite side? How about the wildlife? And wildlife? In the village, we had monkeys who would just laugh in the trees. Like I would walk through, I, I took a lot of walks and a lot of bike rides, even just by myself. I wasn't afraid of getting lost. I think because being a foreigner, all of the locals knew me. And if I mm -hmm. got lost, they would help me find my way home. Um, but there were monkeys, there were stray dogs that walked around. Chickens, quite a few people had, had pets, but other like wildlife, wildlife, just the monkeys. We, we didn't have any elephants or lions near us, um, not in that part of the country. But the monkeys were fun. You would go for walks and they would just be howling and laughing. Your and first day you weren't afraid? No, no, no swinging around. Um, there were spiders, which I'm deathly afraid of <laughs> because they move so fast. Mm -hmm. Like I can squash a spider if I have to, but I remember one day in my bedroom, there was a spider going up the wall and I tried throwing my <laughs> shoes at it and it just went so fast that I had to leave my room. I was, <laughs> it was too scary for me. Where were the closest tigers and elephants? and lions? Closest wild animals um, really probably would have been um, Savo National Park, which okay. there have been movies made, the movie about the, li the man-eating lions at Savo. Ooh. I can't remember the name of the movie right now, but it was filmed there. I took a trip, I guess it was spring break. I went off by myself, all, all three of us were going to different places. I went to Kasumu and then got on a bus and went through Savo National Park. Now I didn't stop there because I was planning to stop at another national park mm -hmm. in Tanzania. So I actually traveled through Savo and that's when I first heard my first lion roaring at night oh. as I went through, which was wonderful. It's, it's so eerie. Um, but then I went through into Tanzania and went on the Tazara Railway. I ended up in um, Zambia and down to Zimbabwe to see Victoria Falls. Mm. But while I was there, there was a national park called Mosio Etanya Game Reserve. And I saw all of the African animals that were on my list. I saw my lions, elephants, bison, 
zebras, buffalo, impala, jackals, leopards, cheetahs, everything. Uh, white rhino, which are, are very rare. Um, so that was great. That was my little holiday. I got all the animals in one shot um, and visited Victoria Falls while I was there. So How was that? It was amazing. They are just the longest falls I've ever seen in my life. They go on and on. They're called Mosio Atanya, which means, I think it's thunder that roars. They also have rainbows that mm. are constantly born every couple of seconds. Rainbows just emerge up out of the mist and fade away and others, they just constantly. How did you keep in contact with people at home when you got homesick? Okay, uh, you write a lot of letters. Letters take time though mm -hmm. and you have to wait for a response. Um, which can be a little heartbreaking, especially when you go to the post office and there's letters and then you find out they're not for you. <laughs> now with three of us there, that happened quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the postmaster, his name was McDonald and I would go to the post office after school to collect the mail. Any mail for me today, McDonald? Hmm, there might be. And then he'd come back, not today, Try again tomorrow, <laughs> which was his standard <laughs> reply. Um, we didn't have a phone in our village, but there was a village about, it was about 10 kilometers, I'm not sure how many miles that is, about 10 kilometers away. So I'd written a letter to one of my very good friends and gave them the phone number of the telephone box in this village. Mm -hmm with the understanding that if I couldn't call out, maybe he could call and we'd get to talk to each other. So this particular Saturday morning, I get up early and I start walking towards the village of Sidindi. And it took me about two and a half hours to wow. walk there with no map. I, I didn't have a map. I just asked people which way Sidindi, this way and through villages. It, it was great. So it took me a while to get there. I get to the village, find the post office, which is where the telephone was. And I was about an hour early from the time that I said I would call my friend. So that was fine. I sit down and of course I have a little trail of kids who follow me and then go off and do their things. So there was a group of kids there who I was talking to. Then a, a man came over to the phone he walked into the phone box and he just started lifting up the receiver and putting it down and lifting up the receiver and putting it down. And I said, oh, is the phone broken? Because I hadn't heard it ring at all oh, while I was no. there. He said, no, the phone works just fine. Okay. I didn't say anything else and he kept picking up the receiver. And I said, well, are you going to use the phone? He said, no, the bell doesn't work. Oh. So I figured out that the bell was broken, but the phone would still work. All of a sudden, he picks up the phone, and then he just started talking. So I thought, this is just one of those moments in Africa where <laughs> crazy things happen. He finished his conversation mm -hmm. and left. The kids had all left. And I thought, well, the phone doesn't ring. If I can't hear it, I'm not going to be able to know when my friend is calling me. So. I started doing what he was doing. I'd pick up the receiver, nothing, and wait. Pick up the receiver, hang it up. Probably about half an hour went by, and finally I picked up the receiver. Hello? Hi! And my friend was there, so I talked to my friend for about an hour and a half, um, which was great, but it's one of those crazy things where the phone works, but the bell doesn't, so. Do you pay for it? I didn't have to pay because my friend called me. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> I didn't have any car. It's not a phone where you have a card, uh -huh. and I wouldn't have had enough mo money to put in. So. so, did you walk there barefoot, or did you have shoes on? I have my my boots. I wore okay. the same pair of boots almost every day. I had a pair of sandals, but my walking, my hiking boots, which all the locals were really intrigued <laughs> by. They thought my feet got really hot. Mm -hmm. because I had these big heavy boots on and I was like, no, I wear wool socks and they keep my feet cool. So, but that was one of those <laughs> shoes. I wear shoes, yes, all the time, every all day. I mentioned malaria. What type of diseases besides that were you affected? 
by? Mo mostly malaria, malnutrition and AIDS. They were the three diseases that were prevalent in the village. Mm -hmm. um, malaria from the waterborne mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. AIDS was everywhere. Um, I think mostly affecting where we were, the older people, not so much mm -hmm. younger children. But malnutrition really affected the, the younger kids. And three teachers who I worked with, um, their children died. One of each of their children died while we were there. Our neighbor's little girl died. Um, and then a, a teacher who I lived next door to on the second last day we were there, her middle child died. And I think that was the toughest one because we'd been there for six months and mm. had grown attached to him. He was one of our little shadows who was always with us. And that was really sad. That was hard to take, especially at the, yeah, the end when it was supposed to be, you know, happy and we said mm -hmm. that we were leaving, but everything was good. And then that just brought everyone down at the end. While you were there, did you get healthier or do you think you got less healthy? Um, I think I stayed about the same. I didn't get sick. I mean, occasionally some food didn't go so well. Mm -hmm. That's to be expected when you travel. That's just one of those things. Um, on the whole, though, I mean, you're outside all day, right. walking every day, and huge long walks on the weekends through the jungles. I think I was probably healthier. If you could rank your top three memories, what do you think they'd be? OK. What did I talk about before? <laughs> um, Four o'clock in the afternoon, just before the thunderstorms would hit, we would have what we called the four o'clock light. I don't know how it works scientifically, but just wherever the sun was, it would be a golden glow. And the color of the skin, the color of the corn reflecting, it made for the most beautiful photos. <laughs> Some of the best photos I took while I was there were of people in the cornfields at four o'clock in the afternoon because it, it was just glowing. So that was just the best memory of the landscape, I think. Seeing a lion mm -hmm. and dancing with Maasai warriors at the game reserve mm -hmm. in Zambia. That was amazing. Um, Maasai are, are considered like the, the native tribe of Africa. So that, that was just really, really fun to. My third favorite memory would have been waking up in the middle of the night with people scratching on my wall. And I had no idea what was going on until I opened my door and standing in the courtyard was everybody who lived in the immediate area. They all had buckets and dishes, containers, water pitchers, all in their pajamas, catching insects. I thought this is something that I don't know what's going on. So I asked my neighbor, I was like, what is this? And she said, once a year, these flying termites will come out of the ground. They will fly around. They will fall back down to the earth and they will burrow underground again. She said, we have one night to collect as many as we can. And I said, what for? Well, to eat. They're very nutritious. So, OK, so we're up in like 3 o'clock in the morning catching flying insects called nguen. Of course, I had to try to eat them mm -hmm. raw. And then the next day, after they were washed and dried and crispy, I had them cooked as well. So I think that would have been like one of the funniest memories that I have and, and one of my favorites because that's not something that happens too often. Yeah. You just mentioned three o'clock in the morning. How did they tell time? Watches. Oh, they had watches? They have watches. <laughs> no clocks. No just clocks. Just watches. Yeah. So how would a, an average student mm -hmm. consider themselves successful? What are their goals for life? Okay. Average student would probably just try to finish high school. Not everybody in their family is going to get that chance. So I think that's one of the goals of every family would be to have at least one of their children finish high school. Um, they tend to just go back to their village and work there. Some might start up their own businesses. If they can go to the polytechnic, 
they could be a dressmaker or the boys could learn how to do masonry or carpentry. Um, the lady next door to us had no job. Before we left, we gave her, we bought her a huge big bag of corn, which she then sold. So she made a profit by selling little cups of corn on the side of the road. So, I mean, there are jobs in the village for, for students to, mm -hmm. to do after they finish school or if they don't finish school. But those that do finish school probably try to go on to become educated in something else or another field or continue education, you know, become a nurse or a teacher, or they would have to travel to a city like Kasumu or Nairobi to get a job. Um, but most either stay in the village, one or two, like I said, would, would move away. Of all the wonderful people that you've met, who do you think influenced you most? I wouldn't say influenced, I'd say maybe inspired would be Adongo, the little girl who lived next door. She worked so hard. She went to school half a day, every day, and then she would come home and spend the other half of the day looking after her cousins who were, she was adopted then, so they would be her brothers. She would look after them. She would work in the gardens. She would collect the water and the firewood. She would make the meal, cook the meal, feed us all because her parents both worked. And I actually wrote a children's book about her, one, to preserve her memory and two, hoping that it's a good idea to teach other students, those here in America or back in Australia, about life in Africa. What's it all about? It's, it's called Mary Adongo. Um, and it's all about what she does in her daily life. But the thing to remember with Mary Adongo was that she had a little catchphrase. Every question you asked her, she would deny knowing anything about it. And she would say, me? I don't know. I'd say, Mary Adongo, did you get the firewood? Me? I don't know. <laughs> and she would laugh, she would smile, but she would never tell you the straight answer. So in this story, after she does the work, everybody asks her what she's been doing or who did this, and her standard response is, me? I don't know. <laughs> um, it's kind of, it, it makes it cute. It's a cute story. What did, how did you change as a person after all of such a unique experience? I think I'm still the same person. Same? Same person, yep. No more conservative with your resources, or were you already that way to begin no, with? No, I was tending towards being conservative. I turn the water off when I brush my teeth. I don't take long showers, because every now and again when I do, I think of, oh, yeah, what if I had to go collect my own water? Mm -hmm. um, I make my children eat what they're served. We don't have leftovers in our house, <laughs> and if we do, we eat them the next day. I just try to teach, I think, my children you know, good morals, probably based on what I learned in Africa. And the question of the hour, do you plan on going back? I would love to go back to Africa. <laughs> it's so far away, and now I'm married with children, so mm -hmm. it would be more difficult, but I've kept in touch with a couple of people from the village. Some have moved away. Some I've... It, it's hard to keep in contact when not many people have computers. Mm -hmm. have learned electricity, um, so you rely on the mail, but post office boxes change and they change jobs so I would love to go back one day and I would go right back to the same village where I was and see if anybody remembered me because I remember them. <laughs> so the Africa trip's over mm -hmm. and what did you do right after it? Right after Africa I got back on the plane and went to London, England. I had had my two-year working holiday visa approved so my plan was to live in England, work, and travel throughout Europe, which I did. I worked at the Australian High Commission as a migration officer, issuing visas. And in the winter, I got on a bus and traveled around Europe for three months. I think in total, I've been to about 30 countries, which seems like a lot, but some of them are all squished together, mm -hmm. and you go through them in an hour, and that was Andorra. And <laughs> um, so, traveled throughout Europe. After Europe, I ended up 
going back to Australia to spend Christmas with my family and was told of an opportunity to teach in China. So I went back to England, finished up working there and went to China, which is where I met my husband. We were both teaching at the same university. So after China was America and here we are. What was your favorite country so far? My favorite country, apart from Africa. Oh, yes, Obviously apart. that one's close to my <laughs> heart. Um, the Czech Republic was really? beautiful. Yeah, Prague would have to be my favorite European city. There's also a little town called Chesky Kromlov, which has a castle and a moat with black bears in it in the middle of the Czech Republic. That would be my favorite small town in Europe. So why so many countries? When you get out of Australia, see what you can, because it costs a lot to get out. Australia is so removed from the rest of the world that we Australians tend to, once we're out, we see whatever we can before we go back. So, yeah. So how did you end up in Mount Carmel? Mount Carmel. <laughs> um, I don't live in Mount Carmel. I live in Pittman, mm -hmm. but my husband is from central PA, so. When he asked me to marry him, I was like, well, I'm already out of Australia. I don't need to live <laughs> there. I may as well come and live here. We settled here. We were actually living in Sealands Grove first, and then he applied for a teaching job at Tri-Valley. Mm -hmm. So we found the uh, sleepy valley of the Mahantungo Valley <laughs> and moved to Pittman, which has even fewer people than Mount Carmel. Yes, it does. Yep. Uh, did you plan on coming to America? Was that on your list of countries? No. Sorry to say, America, when I was growing up, America was not on my no. list of countries to visit. I had no desire whatsoever. Just like Australia, right? To go to America. It was so similar, mm -hmm. I think, to Australia that I didn't think that there would be enough to interest me here. Of course, there's beautiful places and cities mm -hmm. and landmarks, but to live, that never crossed my mind. No. Do you know a lot of languages? No. No? Just English. I guess it's universal. Yeah. Of. I think most people think Australian English is different than American English. Actually, that happened in China where we were teaching. My students were very upset when I would say things the Australian way and not the American way because they wanted to learn American English to succeed in business in America. And I would try to joke with them and say, oh, I'm sorry. I can't teach you American English, but I can teach you Australian English, and that did not go over very well. Of all these amazing experiences, how mm -hmm. can you teach others to be more open? Open culturally? Yeah. Um, I'm hoping my books will do that. I have written two books. One's been published. The second one is in the process of being published. It should be out any week. And then, of course, the third one about Mary Odongo. Mm -hmm. By reading to kids and telling them my stories, that's my way of, of sharing the information that I've gathered and the experiences I've had in different countries. It's been amazing. Thank you so much for coming. And I really hope that people can learn a lot from it, because I sure have. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for coming.